Hi, everyone. So our panelists today, uh, I'll start with uh, with each of our panelists. So Carolyn Zhuang is a PhD candidate at Columbia University in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science. Uh, Caroline is interested in using satellite data, big data sets, and statistical modeling to understand natural hazards in the context of our modern climate. Under her mentorship of her advisor, Dr. Park Williams, she is currently investigating how climate affects wildfires in the Western United States. Um, and Dr. Cassidy Rankin is an earth observation scientist and has worked on forest conservation research and industry adoption of remote sensing and smart forest technologies for sustainable forest management for over a decade. Cassidy brings a deep experience in remote sensing of ecosystem dynamics to his role as senior accountant executive and sustainability specialist at Planet. Cassidy is also a remote sensing specialist in measuring vegetation carbon stocks and fluxes for natural capital and sustainable finance accounting. Saba El Shawa is a Jordanian Canadian interdisciplinary researcher and social entrepreneur originally from Palestine. She is the founder of the Jordan Space Research Initiative, which aims to bring sustainable development with space exploration and establishing an analog research facility in Jordan. So all of our panelists are extremely versed in climate impacts and using space technologies. So I'll get started by asking our panelists. So can you tell us how you got started in space or climate related industries? Can you tell us some projects you are currently working on related to the intersection between space technology and climate action? Maybe let's start with Saba as well, so you can introduce the report a little bit. Okay, sure. So um, I think getting started is uh, very different than where I am now, um, because like all of my work right now works on space and sustainability from different angles. Um, but I would say I've always had a deep interest in space and sustainability. But when I was studying in the Middle East some 12, 13 years ago, about to start university, uh, there really weren't any opportunities to get involved in these fields. I think it was also a much um, smaller discussion related to these topics. Um, so it wasn't until I started my master's in space studies at the International Space University in 2019 that I started getting involved in the intersections between space and sustainability, uh, primarily because my, my main project focused on how we can bridge space and sustainable development for Jordan. Uh, and that's because for countries that don't have a space program or even emerging space countries, it's very hard to justify space for the sake of space. Uh, so you really need to show these intersections and how space can be beneficial for life on Earth. Um, at the same time, uh, during my master's, when I did an internship at the European Space Agency, uh, working at their clean space uh, office, which actually focuses on the environmental impacts of space activities, both on Earth and in space. So that really kind of expanded my view of sustainability uh, as a whole. Um, and right now, uh, I'm also doing my PhD in sustainable development uh, and climate change. So I think it's the journey has been kind of long. But once I found that this is the area that I'm interested in, um, I've become more involved um, also in the within the SJC, um, the uh, advocacy and policy platform that Lindsay was talking about. Um, I was one of the co-leads for the Space for Climate Action uh, Policy Division, which basically created the report that is now the official policy position of the SGAC. Um, and then, uh, as Han also mentioned, I founded the Jordan Space Research Initiative to bridge um, sustainable development with uh, space exploration and specifically through analog research. So essentially, there are simulations of space that can help us test our technologies uh, for future space exploration and habitation, but at the same time, there's a lot of intersections with areas that can help with us uh, living more sustainably on Earth. Uh, and so that's something that focuses more on the technology and strategy side. Um, and then finally, my PhD, I'm looking also at the motivational aspect of space, which is something I think is often overlooked uh, in these discussions. Um, if you haven't heard of the overview effect, it's basically when astronauts see the Earth from space and that changes their, the way that they think about sustainability, um, about social and environmental issues. And so my PhD research looks at 
um, whether we can simulate this with virtual reality to be able to bring it to more people and actually validate if it causes this neuropsychological shift uh, in behavior as well. So I like to touch a bit on all the different aspects of, of space and sustainability in my work. Yep, let's go over to our next panelist as well. Uh, Cassidy, do you wanna, do you wanna start? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, how did I get started in space and climate? Uh, it was about 15 years ago, probably at the tail end of my grad uh, or my undergraduate career, which was in evolutionary uh, ecology and looking at environmental dynamics. And we were working on a project in Brazil and a couple across Latin America, where the World Bank had funded large irrigation projects to bring more consistent agricultural production to areas prone to drought. And as part of that project, which was expanding agricultural activity, there was uh, forest being converted uh, for, for farmland and other areas that were being conserved uh, basically to offset. I mean, these were the days of the, the very first red programs to offset the, the farmland conversion. We were measuring the ecological succession. So how the forest regenerates, how all the ecosystem services regenerate, the biodiversity um, before biodiversity credits were a thing. Carbon credits were just starting to evolve in the early days. And the research was to understand how do we measure these things across very large spatial scales with, with consistency and metrics that can quantify efficacy of these land conservation um, plans. And so using older satellite technologies like MODIS and Landsat, uh, we were testing the ways of actually being able to measure ecosystem service regeneration and recovery, the rate that they come back and whether they actually come back to the degree of the pre-disturbed ecological uh, conditions. And so er early on, I was doing ground validation for earth observation technologies and over the course of my grad program, where I eventually was doing the validation of time series for measuring this um, kind of forestry dynamics in the tropics, I, I saw the power of being able to see all of this uh, at very large scales from satellite technologies using uh, emerging uh, technologies in the earth observation space. And that, that drove me into a career to actually found some companies, uh, several startup companies in that space. And then uh, when I learned that Planet uh, had built this constellation that could image the whole world every day at a resolution that let us see the detail we needed to, to measure these, these ecological processes and carbon dynamics and carbon fluxes on the landscape, uh, I jumped at the opportunity of getting involved uh, at Planet. And we're, we're, we're finally at a point where these earth observation technologies can give, give us really high confidence to build metrics for policy uh, management and understanding efficacy. Uh, so there's a number of projects I'm working on, probably too many to mention, because um, part of the question I think was, you know, what are we currently working on? And one thing that I'm really excited about is now with really high frequency measurements from, from orbit, call it daily or, or weekly, uh, we can get a much clearer picture and predictive abilities of where land surface forest and uh, conserved areas are are moving with the changing climate so if you think of um, maybe like medical monitoring technologies you know maybe you would go to your doctor in old age once a year and get a physical you get one data point a year and doctors would have to try to figure out whether you're you're getting sick or not now with modern technologies like smart watches or smart devices where we're literally measuring our heart rate and all of the physiology in a consistent basis, this gives us the ability to predict with much more power the trajectory of these health of these ecosystems and the way that our management practices are, are going to turn out uh, without having to be as responsive. So that's, a, that's an exciting area that I'm, I'm working on. Yeah, that sounds super fascinating. Um, and Caroline, do you want to share more about what you do as well? Yes, definitely. And like Saba and Cassidy, thank you for inviting us to the panel. Uh, hearing both of their introductions, I see where we all come together in this space of Earth and space. 
<laughs> so for me, like Saba, I'm a PhD student right now. I study at Columbia University in New York City here in the United States. I focus as a lot on wildfires at the moment. And so it's fa been fascinating coming to this point because it wasn't always apparent to me which direction I would go as I pursue my studies. And so it was back between high school and college where I first realized that NASA, you know, the um, NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration was involved in earth sciences. Because for the longest time as a high school student, as a middle school student, you know, I think a lot of us, especially in this chat, have this dream of becoming an astronaut. And it wasn't until I did an internship working on landslides of all things, like dirt debris falling down in incline um, was where I realized that we have all these satellites positioned in order to look down at earth and study things like precipitation that can trigger landslides or other variables like, you know, we study ice, we study the oceans, we study the forests. And that's where I realized that like, oh, this, it, this is really cool. And this is a great way for me to be involved in space, um, which really fascinated me in other ways, but also be looking at the earth and understanding, you know, what is climate change? Like, how is that going to affect us into the future? And so for my college experience, I did a lot of research on forests, namely the Harvard forests in Massachusetts, looking at how carbon exchange was affecting the, or how carbon exchange was balanced between photosynthesis and respiration of these trees and how that might be changing over time because they have such a long record of measuring carbon exchange in the atmosphere since 1991. And then that, and then that change translated into going back to NASA after I graduated from college, working again on landslides and trying to launch a citizen science project called Landslide Reporter, which is still available where anyone around the world can submit landslides to a global database. And it was then at that second time at NASA where I realized I want to pursue a PhD and study more about how we can model these changes in the atmosphere, how we can combine things like precipitation, like temperature, you know, like how temperature is increasing with CO2, all these different factors into studying natural hazards. And there was a big landslide event that was triggered by a wildfire in California in, back in 2018 that then led me on this path to thinking more about wildfires and wanting to study with my current advisor, Dr. Park Williams, on how is climate change affecting wildfires? And as we've been seeing recently, I mean, I've been breathing in recently in New York City that these changes are global, that, that wildfires happening in Canada and the Western United States, the smoke can travel across the continent and affect people in other cities and that everything is really intertwined. And I think satellites and the role of space in all of this really brings together um, how we can monitor and protect the earth into the future. And then I also want to mention more of like my space role is that I, I, it wasn't actually until 2017 after I graduated college where I joined the Brooke Owens Fellowship. And that's where I was connected for the first time with the commercial space industry side. So learning more about organizations like Cassidy's organization Planet where, that are actively producing commercial satellites to continue to monitor the earth on such fine resolution scales. And th that gave me this uh, interest in continuing to combine space and earth into the future. Oh, and I guess the one last question about what I'm currently working on is still doing my PhD. And right now I am really looking at this connection of how uh, changes in, uh, we probably heard like El Nino, La Nina, this, El Nino Southern Oscillation in the tropical Pacific Ocean is connected to changes over land in the Western United States. So I'm really looking, using satellite data actually, using Landsat data, using MODIS data from satellites to look at these large scale changes in burned area and what we should expect into the future. Thanks, Caroline, that was great. Thanks for a good overview. Um, Saba, do you mind giving us yeah, a, a few, maybe three kind of big takeaways from uh, the report that SGAP put out last year and um, 
yeah, what have been the big takeaways for you from that report? Um, yeah, so I think um, the report, the really the goal of the report was to be as transdisciplinary as possible and look at the idea of space for climate action from different uh, angles and backgrounds. So even the team that we had, um, you know, we had lawyers, we had engineers, we had educators, planetary scientists. So it, we really looked at all these different um, parts. And I think um, for me, uh, maybe I can just mention briefly, because I think we were talking about it before the webinar started. Um, so we did look at, you know, science and technology, of course, uh, earth observations, spin-off technologies. Um, we also looked at the environmental impacts of space activities. Uh, we looked at uh, education and outreach, how we can use space, um, how we can change our education systems to incorporate space more um, to actually make it more valuable, but then also how space can be used as uh, an educational tool for sustainability. We looked at ethical and political considerations. So um, the fact that the space industry is actually a very political field, and then there's also so many limitations that come with that, which might lead us in, in a different direction that we really want to go. When you think about the climate crisis, it really is a global crisis. It's something we should, um, all of humanity should be working to, to tackle together. Um, but we still see a lot of divides um, in accessibility and in, in what's um, like, for example, with Earth, Earth observation data, you know, the people who need it the most typically don't have access to that data or they don't know how to use it. So that's a huge gap um, that we need to, to bridge. Um, I think the, the main takeaway for me is really also going about space exploration in a sustainable and ethical way. Um, I think in the space industry, we know that space is really good for monitoring the earth, for helping us uh, solve these problems. Um, but like I said, there is a huge gap between people in the space industry and the general public and the people, the end users who actually need to be able to use this data um, to solve the problem. So really our recommendation centered around how we can, um, from three different uh, stakeholder point of view, so the commercial industry, which is um, able to do a lot more actually than government uh, sometimes. Uh, we looked at also, of course, government and policymakers, um, and then the scientific community and academia. So um, we had a lot of recommendations that, that tie into these different topics, uh, targeting these different stakeholders. Um, but I would say the underlying kind of, um, idea behind the recommendations is these are the things that we as the you know the space generation as we call it or the younger people getting involved in the space industry um, these are what we see as priorities and we really want the space industry to reflect um, our ethical values and to actually be used to to benefit life on earth um, so I'll, I'll include a link to the chat here in the chat here so people can look at the report um, we are working on an executive summary if you don't want to, to read the, the whole 50 page report, but I definitely recommend at least going through the recommendations to give you an idea of just how broad uh, these recommendations can be. Great, and thank you so much for sharing the report. So the next question, uh, so we've touched on this topic a little bit in your introduction, so such as revisit rates, remote sensing, constellation size, data quality, access for different communities, and uh, the resolutions that you get. So what are some benefits and limitations on using space technology for climate monitoring? You've touched on it a little bit before, but can you talk more about those benefits and limitations? Um, and um, I guess anyone can start, yeah. That's a fun topic. I could start. Like, so my lens is generally through Earth observation. There's obviously lots of other areas of space technologies that are gonna contribute to this. But the general trend we're seeing from nature-based solutions uh, for climate mitigation and emissions kind of recapturing carbon is that for, for big industry and for companies and markets to start to move towards these offset programs. And, you know, I've, I've built a new mine and I've disturbed this, this type of environment that sequesters X amount of carbon, provides X number of biodiversity services. I need to find another site that I can offset that, that probably doesn't have that same 
mineral value for a mine that has those environmental similarities and, and climate mitigation capabilities. And then make sure that's protected and not disturbed. So companies are investing more and more in these, what we can label ESG um, capabilities and offsets and investing heavily in that. And in order to quantify that and make sure that those are effective policies, there's something called spatial finance and the ability to actually location by location understand all of your assets as a corporation or, or, or as, a, as a public entity, for example, um, and tracking whether those assets are being uh, disturbed, disrupted, lost by climate related events. Uh, that includes natural assets like off like nature based uh, offsets. There's no better way to do that than from a remote sensing Earth observation platform because it's it's global, obviously, it's standardized and it's it's an independent observation as opposed to a self-reported by, by companies that are reporting to their stakeholders or shareholders on these on these assets and how climate risks are affecting those assets. So there's a huge motivation there to use space technologies from that business standpoint as we shift our economies over to more sustainable economies. And then as a, as a general comment, just on sustainability, I think everybody that's getting into this private sector of space technology development and deployment understands that there's, there's major upsides in, in the business sense of using a space-based orbital technology uh, to help facilitate and accelerate digital transformation and sustainable business transformations. Yeah, I'll add on to that to agree with everything that Cassidy said, that there's this really cool path forward for businesses to cooperate with climate. I also want to add on to the longer term picture of like being a user of the space data is that we are kind of at this cusp where space data is like finally becoming super useful for th these longer term pictures of quantifying climate. And so, for example, with wildfire burned area, like we've been collecting observations with Landsat since 1984. And that's coming up now on 40 years of data, which is amazing. But it's like these this, this decadal scale of like more than 10 years where we can really start to see patterns of things like long-term ocean changes, like sea surface temperature changes, and be able to connect that with these annual to uh, interannual scale changes of like wildfire and, and um, seasonal changes of precipitation and snow. So being able to, so in, in a way that's like a positive thing and a limitation where it where we really care in order to maximize how we can characterize the earth, we need these longer term scales and space for a while hasn't really been there with that. But then with the onset of new satellite technologies that can capture it, um, higher temporal scale, so satellites that have been there for a while now, but also adding on this effect of um, higher spatial scales, where we have gone from measuring like a few degrees latitude and longitude to measuring fine scales of even down to like one meter, basically, then we can get a better picture of the earth and use that data in looking and monitoring climate change. Um, yeah, so from from my perspective, um, I want to talk about the, um, I don't know if you were at the Global Space Conference uh, for Climate Change, which just happened in, in Norway uh, in May. Uh, I worked on a paper for that conference uh, with two of my colleagues, uh, Stephen George from ESA, who uh, does Earth Observation, and Jordan Stone, who's also a PhD at uh, Imperial College London. He's a planetary scientist. Um, and so we took these three different angles where uh, we're looking at the Earth observation, um, the spin-off technologies, and the planetary science. And the idea was basically using space for natural disasters. We specifically looked at floods because that has been happening a lot more frequently. And the more that we did um, kind of the background research, we, we really concluded that, you know, the technology already exists. The data already exists. Like... We have all of this information, but we're just not using it in the right way. I think the limitations really do come from um, political and you know policy limitations. 
um, especially as I was saying earlier, for a lot of the people who are suffering from these natural disasters, um, either they don't have access to the same resources or they don't have the, the capability to use them in a way that makes sense. Um, and so ultimately our paper that started out as a, here's how technology can help, um, space technology can help with climate, it became more, here's how we need to bridge the gap uh, in the policy and the implementation, because um, especially for you know, countries that have a lower GDP, does that mean that they don't get the same kind of support um, in case of a natural disaster? Um, and we really do think that the, the financial side of this is also that all countries should be contributing um, to this emergency response in proportion to their GDP. Uh, so it's something where, you know, just because it's impacting a country different than yours doesn't mean that they're, they have to handle it by themselves. Like this really is a global crisis. Um, uh, and I think also an, an interesting point that, you know, uh, Cassidy was also talking about is when you're looking at ESG um, for businesses, I think um, that kind of ties back to like how we think about sustainability, especially in uh, in the commercial sector. Um, typically, they talk about economic sustainability. So in the sense that even when we talk about going to the moon in a sustainable way, it's like, okay, how do we make it so that it's uh, financially feasible and we can you know, get a return on this? Um, but true sustainability also includes obviously environmental sustainability um, and also social sustainability. So making sure that um, you know, the, the solutions, the technology that we have is accessible to everyone. Like we keep saying space is for everyone, but it's really not the case. We really need to bridge that gap. Um, and then also from the environmental perspective, uh, I like that you were mentioning the, the natural assets. So being able to monitor that as well. Uh, I think it's unfortunate that we have to look at things through this kind of economic lens, but because that is the case, I think it is important for companies to realize that you know, investors and consumers also care about these these different aspects. And so uh, even if you're only looking at the economic sustainability, you should really think about the environmental and the, the social sustainability that comes along with that. Those are all great, great points. I want to jump in a little bit on your comment of like adoption. And, and you know, we have this capability. We have these technologies. Why aren't we using it as much as we could? That's kind of my day-to-day -day job at Planet is helping companies and government, both public and private uh, organizations, adopt commercial space technology. And it's an it's a interesting dance for organizations that don't have the technical capabilities necessarily to, to jump into an investment in a new type of, uh, call it Earth observation data, or it could be a positioning technology from new positioning satellites. And as soon as you bring up the concept of, okay, these are satellites and these are in orbit, there's the funny shift that happens with a lot of people we talk to that they automatically assume, okay, this is way too complicated. This is going to be difficult. And I don't have time and resources to invest to figure out what it is exactly that you're doing. Uh, because, I, you know, that's a big shift for my organization. We don't have space specialists. We don't have rocket scientists. And so a big part of what I'm seeing is when I have these conversations and say, you know, are you guys, do you, does your company have a space strategy, a space tech strategy, or are you, are you thinking about that for the future? What, what does your business look like in five years? Or what does your government department look like in five years with space technologies? We almost have to leave the technology out of the equation and entirely focus on the positive outcomes. Because as soon as you dive into the tech and you're speaking to a non-technical person, which is usually a higher level decision maker, they, they kind of shut off. <laughs> and they have this mind, this mental block around this, this is too difficult. So that's a that's a challenge we face in adoption, but I think there's ways around it as long as we focus really on what are the outcomes of this technology. Let's focus on how it changes our, our, our practices and not how the technology works. Yeah, thank you all. Um, those are all really great points. Um, and we started having a lot of questions roll in. So um, I was going to ask one more, but I think I'm going to skip that so we can leave time to answer as many uh, audience questions as possible. Um, so Han, do you want to uh, pick our first audience question? 
Yeah, sure. Let's do it. Uh, so Anya asked if, uh, can you discuss some of the limitations of the ESG model in keeping businesses accountable? Uh, do you consider this a tool that can properly address the magnitude of the climate crisis? Anyone want to start? On I that mean, one? I think I, I think I kind of uh, said a few things about that already. I think, in my opinion, uh, I don't think it's, you know, the a comprehensive tool. I think it's very unfortunate that we have to go down this avenue, but ultimately. Um, like I was saying, like the companies want to look, you know, for the most part at the bottom line and ESG is a way to make them think about the fact that this will hurt your bottom line if you're not adhering uh, to, you know, some of these policies. But unfortunately, it is also, you know, a huge limitation in the sense that it leads to a lot of greenwashing. You see a lot of companies, you know, put here are the sustainable development goals that we contribute to. And then if you actually ask them about the targets, they don't even know uh, what, what they're about. Um, so I definitely think having, you know, I, I'm not familiar, maybe Cassidy knows a bit more about this, but when you audit a company and you look at the ESG, uh, who's actually doing that and what are they actually looking at? I think that would be a way to maybe, you know, overcome some of the limitations. It is just one tool in the toolbox. It's a very powerful tool if we're talking about earth observation and imagery and other types of remote sensing, because it gives you this very economical approach uh, to cover very large areas and widely distributed assets at low low cost. Um, but I think as we see, you know, scope two, scope three emissions starting to be uh, required disclosures for companies. That's and this will touch on maybe one of the questions I saw someone else ask as well. That level of transparency and how you're developing your business goods and services and where those emissions are coming from all ends of the production spectrum. This space technology, yeah, it might take a big bucket of fuel to get you into orbit, but pound for pound, the information and the data value from these satellite systems is exponentially greater than other remote sensing or ground-based monitoring. And there's a, there's a good expression from a group we work with in the carbon uh, credit uh, market development space that we shouldn't be burning carbon to measure carbon. So that's something to keep in mind, like if people are flying aircrafts or driving around to, to measure and monitor things, uh, there's, there's huge opportunities. Uh, it, it is an exponential. I think it's several orders of magnitude lower carbon emission to measure something from satellite than from a ground vehicle or, or aircraft. So that'll start to come out in these disclosures with scope two and three. Yeah, so that, that's a good transition. I think I'll, I'll ask a related question from the chat. Um, do you think space will contribute to reduction of CO2 emissions um, by things such as orbital manufacturing and space mining in the next 20 years? It's from Andrew. We started to touch on ways it could help reduce um, so any other thoughts on that? I don't know anything about orbital manufacturing. Is that like or like building stuff in orbit? Or for yeah, orbit? I think that's I think that's what they're talking about. Um, building things in orbit um, on space stations, things like that. So I'm I I have a, a very strong opinion about this. <laughs> I think um I think in orbit uh, servicing and orbit manufacturing is very cool. What I take issue with is kind of this narrative uh, that's also, you know, been shared by Jeff Bezos last year is like, you know what, we're going to help the earth by just like taking all of the polluting industry up into space. And that is like such a problematic way of thinking to me, because you're not saying we're going to reduce pollution, we're going to reduce resource extraction, uh, any of that. I think that that's part of the problem when you think of um, environmental impact is just uh, carbon emissions to the atmosphere because environmental impact can take many different forms, um, biodiversity loss, resource overconsumption, the, the way we're impacting the oceans, like not all of it is just I'm going to, you know, not emit carbon into the atmosphere so I'm helping save the earth. Uh, so I think that's a huge uh, problem in mentality and ideology, the way that we think about the climate crisis or even, uh, you know, space debris is a huge problem. I think uh, where, where I like the idea of in-orbit servicing is 
using the so the space debris that's already orbiting the earth which is you know becoming more and more of a problem using that material that's already out there to recycle to repurpose uh to take it you know to the moon to rebuild infrastructure um then that's also kind of building on the idea of you know reusing the junk that we already have instead of let's just you know proceed with business as usual, but just take it off planet, because I don't think that's actually going to solve any of our problems. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, Saba, and I, I want to add to that because I got to take a look at the SGAC report on this climate action, and if we think even just to the introduction of that report, thinking about what are the main carbon emissions, like where are they coming from, and Two of those industries that come to mind are, for example, fossil fuels, right? And I don't, and if we're going to mine fossil fuels and we're going to continue using fossil fuels for powering our cars, powering our industry, you know, electricity, then that's not really an industry we can take to space because then we would still need to bring those fossil fuels down from space back to Earth in order to power those things. And that ultimately would not reduce CO2 emissions. And then the other thing is agriculture, which is fundamentally something that is unique to Earth. And so being able to reduce our, our carbon footprints in these large scale agricultural practices, that would make a lot bigger of a difference. And so we're going back to like where space will contribute. I think that part of it is thinking about, you know, sending up satellites in order to monitor our current carbon emissions. That's going to be really important. But also thinking about all these new space industries, uh, space companies, space startups that are emerging. And I think that these companies should be considering their own ability to protect the earth and be a sustainable practice, whether that's um, making sure that the environmental impact of their launch site is reduced, making sure that the materials used for building rockets, building satellites are sustainable materials, um, all the way to uh, just the um, just the organizations that they work with and making sure that they are, everyone in this entire pipeline is held accountable for their emissions and for the materials used. Can I add one thing also, Caroline, just reminded me, I'm really glad you brought up the different industries, um, because I think when we're in the space industry, we often forget that it's the space and defense industry and all of the negative social and environmental impact that comes from military activities is actually directly attributed to the space industry as well, just because they're so tightly coupled. Um, and I think that goes back to the point of not thinking of sustainability just as um, I need to reduce carbon emissions, right? Social sustainability is also really huge. Um, but even if you just look at environmental impact, like the, the US military industrial complex pollutes more than entire countries. So that's something that we really need to be aware of, um, especially being that we are in the space industry and, and the science and technology that we work on developing. It's often kind of, you know, um, the, the ethical considerations are kind of ignored or it's it's thought of as like a loophole that, yeah, it's dual use. So, you know, it has to be used in this way. Um, but I like to think of dual use as something that can also help Earth and not be used for, um, you know, social and environmental destruction. Uh, so that's definitely something that we we touched upon, upon a bit in the report when we we're talking about the environmental impacts of the industry. Um, but it's a much larger conversation that needs to happen as well. I might provide a counter view to one of the points. And it's about, you know, maybe using space as a place for waste disposal. I think it's important to remember that the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So that's an important point to consider when we're talking about the, the level of sustainable development, just the sheer level of development we're going to see around the globe. You know, myself coming from a perspective of, you know, a relatively well-off country and a, and a, I would say, highly educated, well-developed environment uh, from an economic standpoint, there's very, very major changes coming to the human development landscape in continents like Africa and Southeast Asia and around the world, we're going to see developments that are going to have to be supported 
and there's going to be tons of waste and sustainability challenges. So we have to remember that there's, there's this huge counterbalance in where the world will be developed over the next 10 to 20 years and how we have to innovate to account for that. So I used to be of the mindset that we should be doing everything we can to reduce and, and limit development for sustainable environmental purposes. But the reality is when the options for the many that don't have access to the resources that we might have in North American cities, for example, uh, their decision-making processes are very different. And there's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of waste management and energy management that we have to innovate around. And I think the space solution, and I, I think back if many of you are familiar with the Futurama episode of just launching a large waste or garbage ball into space and then it comes back at us. I think we're gonna use space for waste disposal. Um, that's my opinion though. Yeah, so I'm going to use that to transition. Uh, we've had a few people ask questions related to equity and data access and sharing. Um, so I'm, I'm going to transition to that. Um, I'm going to try to summarize a few questions at once, and then I'll let you all <laughs> take it and run with it. Um, so does private sector control of satellites jeopardize access for least developed countries or small island developing states with limited resources or constraints? Uh, should satellites be centrally controlled for the purpose of climate action? Um, given that access to space is unequal um, and space activity can be highly polluting, what actions need to be discuss to ensure fairness in these activities between more advanced countries and those with more modest space programs? And lastly, are there any efforts to collaborate with indigenous communities um, and monetize their sustainability methods? Anyone wanna take a stab at some of those questions? Any of those questions? I got, lot, I got lots to say on that stuff, but if, if either other panelist wants to start. I think you can go ahead. It's a lot to, to digest, so I'll, I'll try to. <laughs> so maybe on that last point first, um, I can speak from Planet's perspective. We are working very closely with Indigenous communities um, and traditional peoples, first peoples across the planet to help empower their ability to claim rights over their traditional territories. Uh, I'm doing work in Canada specifically to help uh, organizations and First Nations people in the north help prevent overdevelopment of their land bases and they're using satellite imagery to, to basically support their cases of overdevelopment and over exploitation of resources and in terms of access I mean for, again from from the planet lens uh, we work very closely with public sectors as well we open our data for non-governmental and non-profit uh, non-commercial uses uh, at low to no cost and we, uh, we give the ability to actually task satellites over to the end user. So you can go in and with a user interface and many new space uh, startups with Earth observation technologies are doing this. We've got software now where you can go and task satellites where you need it, um, which is pretty cool to have that ability uh, as a civilian. And the cost has come down exponentially in the last five years alone to do something like that. Um, and then going back to the first question around equal access and I'll, I'll just mention Planet because that's the position I'm in currently has done a really interesting thing and is registered now as a public uh, for benefit corporation. So one of very few private groups that went public uh, on the marketplace, but has a designation of public for good. So we are accountable to the public good in our quarterly reportings and annual reportings. And, and how that's done is, is very creatively uh, structured, but I think it's an example that other organizations can follow. Do you guys have an opinion on where access is less equitable than it should be? I'm going to let Caroline go ahead because I feel like I talked a lot on the last point, but I'll add a few points at the end. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah, add a little bit to the thinking about the inequity in access, because I think that's a really important point that is still a challenge 
but I can speak that there are several ways that that people are tackling this. And so when I was working with NASA and I was on the Earth Sciences Division part of it, one of their they actually have an applied science arm that actually deals with this issue of access by providing applied remote sensing training. So there's an applied remote sensing training program called NASA RSET. And so this is like one of the one of their like many ways of being able to provide access to countries to just be able to give people who want to use NASA satellite remote sensing data, like which inherently is it's open to everybody, right? And I know that the at that the European uh union also has like their own side of this as well of like free data and being able to i think we touched upon this earlier which is that you know like the data is there but in being able to use it in a way that's meaningful to different countries is what is a bottleneck currently and so i'm really happy to hear from cassidy that you know the planet is working closely on this and i have been also very impressed with planets initiatives to even just bring remote sensing data from planet to academics, for example. And I think that they have a whole arm which just covers how do we use planet data and they have a whole portal to be able to download the data. And so NASA has this R set program to be able to train people on small, like specific things like, you know, how do we look monitor wildfires, uh, emissions, you know, so or like how do we monitor water quality or even things like um how do we apply um, looking at air pollution for environmental justice, for example. So that's like one arm of it. I think in terms of data access, and this is more on like the response side of things, there is a disasters charter that happens that is activated uh, globally whenever there is a huge nat natural disaster that affects a lot of people around the world. And, you know, like specifically, you know, possibly like flooding in India, for example, or in Pakistan, or then, you know, that the large wildfires that erupted across Europe or like the heat wave, things like, like these like really huge scale disasters, then this disasters charter is activated to then ask people around the world, companies, both commercial companies and government organizations to provide data in order to assist that effort. And I think that there still can be more done in terms of then like the data's passed forward, you know, what can we then do with this data that is definitely a developing thing but to have the data is really important and hopefully that at least on the disasters um assistant response side affects things but i think that you know i think actually a question that also that i've been seeing coming up from kyle later on which is you know the connection between uh the mitigation side of things like we like we have this data we're monitoring how can we then uh, link that to predicting future uh, human issues that we need that need to be tackled and how can we mitigate them before they happen and I think that's where a lot of research comes in in terms of being able to combine the ability to do scientific modeling to combine different variables using our satellite data and using on ground data to understand then where conflict might erupt. So I think it's an ongoing field. I think that we have the tools and I think that technology is developing very quickly and actually with the onset of machine learning as well to be able to tackle these issues. Yeah, I um, I just want to add on, I think um, from the data accessibility point of view, um, like Caroline was saying, you know, some organizations, NASA, ESA, they do make a lot of data publicly available. Um, again, the gap is like, how can you actually use the data? But another issue is that um, the data isn't always um, accessible in the sense that sometimes uh, because of political reasons, uh, you're not allowed to, even for a private company, cannot share uh, you know, a certain resolution uh, of data over an area. Um, I know this is a huge problem uh, in Palestine, like up till just two or three years ago, there was um, literally legally in the US, you were not allowed to share uh, the certain resolution of data um, over occupied Palestine. And I think 
that's a huge problem, not just from the human rights perspective, but also for people living in those areas that want to monitor the impact of climate, the impact of um, human migration, and is it due to climate reasons or other human rights violations? Um, there's a lot of ways that this can keep people, um, you know, from actually using the data that's even available. Um, and I wanted to add also on the, the question on um, indigenous knowledge. I think we should be careful about, you know, saying we want to modernize it or um, like incorporate it uh, in, in our way, because I think often in, in the space industry and in scientific um, I, I'm an engineer, so I know a lot of scientists and engineers and we, you know, they, they tend to think like, I know the best solution, I know the answer, I just need to teach other people to like catch up basically. Um, and I think that's a, that's a huge problem in the way that we think in the space industry as well, that like, you know, space is going to save us all and we just need people to get on board. Um, so I, I really appreciate that, like what Cassidy was saying, what Planet's doing is they're actually working with those indigenous communities to figure out how they want to use space and not imposing it on them because um, it's, it's really a big problem in the space industry. If you think about the observatories that we've built, the, the launch uh, centers that we've built, they're all built on indigenous land um, and without involving those people. And so rightly, you know, they're going to resist a lot of what we call progress in the space industry because it's it's actually taking uh, their land away, their way of, of life. Um, and so I think it's it's more about really involving them in the space industry and learning from them as well uh, and not just, you know, imposing our own um, belief system, really. Like it's it's a way of perpetuating epistemic injustice, the idea that our knowledge system and our science is more valuable than theirs is just because we don't understand theirs, we don't engage with them. So I think that's something that we really need to work on um, in the space industry. Yeah, great, thank you. And so far, all of these stories have been really interesting. Uh, as we are closing, uh, I'll ask a very quick questions and let you all have an op opportunity to make closing remarks. Uh, so just combining Cal's and Will's question, do you see a future where we can uh, preemptively provide uh, humanitarian relief or solutions using sp space technology uh, and Earth observation data to address a lot of changes? And do you have any other examples of how we can use remote sensing and space technology to make polluters pay, for example? So, and I'll give you an opportunity to make closing remarks as well, yeah. Who wants to start? I, okay, I volunteered, I guess. Um, well, we are doing that as Planet, for sure. We're already at the point where uh, commercial data and private data combined, um, and that's a key topic that we could spend a whole section on, is ensuring interoperability of different platforms and observation technologies, because that's a challenge that is, is still being faced, and one that isn't talked about enough, I think, is that new systems coming online need to be consistently interoperable with existing ones, so we've got a long enough data record to work with to get to predictive abilities. Uh, and, but we are working closely with a number of organizations internationally, nonprofits at Planet that are using our, our, our data to predict uh, humanitarian crises and, and getting resources mobilized uh, ahead of time or close to real time as possible. And that's the, the mission, you know, I think as all Earth observation scientists would agree, the big driver for getting this technology out in orbit for monitoring our planet is to just increase our ability to be more proactive and, and less reactive to the challenges that, that seem to pop up uh, more often than we'd like. Uh, I think I can maybe add to that from the, the spin-off technology perspective. Uh, I think, you know, Earth observation is especially great for monitoring, uh, predicting, um, certain things, but again, part of climate action is also adaptation and being able to deal when these the crises actually happen. Um, and so if you think about space technology that we're developing to live in harsh environments, um, whether it's related to 
uh, the actual infrastructure that we're building, how resilient it is, uh, the, the the agriculture and really, uh, you know, environments that are not meant to grow plants, but we're still figuring out ways to do that. Um, the way that we treat our water recycling, there's so many different areas where um, especially in immediately after a crisis, if you need, for example, temporary housing, um, if you need robotics for search and rescue, like these are areas where there's so much research being done um, for space applications that can also really help us um, to actually adapt um, and to create more resilient communities and societies here on Earth. Yeah, and I'll just add one more piece to this, which is I really like to see this increasing future of increasing data access and increasing Earth observations with new satellites coming online, because I think it's, it'll really allow us to adapt, like, like Saba said, to this changing climate, because we have this better finger on the pulse of what our fisheries are doing and how our agricultural hotspots are doing as climate warms and as uh, precipitation patterns change. We'll be able to predict that better with an understanding of what were the long-term drivers of climate. So like, you know, what is happening in these large scale uh, patterns of oceans interacting with the atmosphere that occur over 10 years to 40 years to a hundred year cycles. And then we can apply that looking into the future and seeing like, okay, if temperature is changing and shifting this much, you know, what should we expect? And should we then choose to plant more drought resistant crops or should we choose to, you know, limit fishing, overfishing in this area? Or do we need to then shift gears to think about the, our own consumption of meat products or, you know, shifting to, uh, more plant-based foods, all of these kind of considerations and that 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 lead to conflict and lead to changes in human migration patterns and living situations. And I think that this is a great way forward that space is enabling this to be able to tackle these issues. All right, I think uh, we are a little bit over time, so um, we're gonna wrap it up there. But if any of you wanna give a quick one, two sentence closing remark before we do that, uh, now's your moment. Okay, I will say <laughs> we've talked about science and technology a lot. Again, I really want to stress that this is such an interdisciplinary field, especially space itself is interdisciplinary. Sustainability and environmental protection is interdisciplinary. So you really need to think about all the different angles. Like we we shouldn't reduce it to just, you know, space technology is going to help, period. That's it. Like there's so many different things that we don't even understand yet. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really just wanted to point that out and uh, also the motivational aspect of space, like the blue marble image, the Earthrise image, these things are not, they came from space science and technology, but they also change the way that people feel and think about the planet. And I think that's just as valuable. Um, and I'll leave it there. I'll just pile onto that. I mean, I, I started working in, in the dirt and with microbes and you know, very microscope level research. And then when I got into uh, yeah, remote sensing and earth observation and earth system science, and then into the business domain and public sector, as soon as my, my, my perspective shifted from the top down, I've seen the whole planet as a whole. Uh, it, it, really, it really does change your, your perception of the challenges we're facing and how cross border uh, this, this problem set becomes and these opportunities to work on it together. So leave it there. Yeah, and finally, just echoing both of my panelists, my co-panelists, I just really think that we all have some kind of tools in our toolkit, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a policymaker or a scientist or an engineer, or even if you're a student still studying in school, you know, you have the power to be able to affect this dialogue on climate change. And if you're interested in going into the space industry, like there's 
a multitude of ways that sustainability can happen all the way from the ground level, you know, maybe digging in the dirt or all the way into space and thinking about space debris and what we're going to do with waste in the future. So I think that there's all kinds of angles and I, we only touched on just a little bit in an hour. There's so much more we could talk about. Amazing. Thank you all. Um, then we're going to wrap it up there. Um, super grateful to uh, all of you for attending and for our panelists for joining us. Um, I will be sharing this recording as well. So yeah, thanks everybody.